Imagine we just uh, finished the big holiday last night. Everybody's a little holiday out, right? But Baruch Hashem, I'm sure you all had an amazing Yom Tovim, starting from Rosh Hashanah into Yom Kippur, into Sukkot, into Simchas Teva, davening and singing and dancing and obviously eating and eating yet more. And um, Baruch Hashem, yesterday morning, actually I should say yesterday in the afternoon over here, is when we, um, was the day of Simchas Torah, the final day of the holidays, which was celebrated by also concluding, reading the end of the Torah. The Torah is made up by five books, the Chumash, Chumash from the Hebrew word Chamesh, which has the five books of Moses. The Rishit, Shmot, Vayikra, Bamidbar, Dvarim, or in English, Genesis and Exodus, and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. So uh, every week we read and study a Parsha of the week. This is an institution which has the Rambam, my man of his rights, this was instituted by Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, um, created this uh, takana, he calls it, takana in English means more like an enactment that the um, Jewish community all over the world shall study and read one portion a week in a way that by the end of the year you go through the entire cycle of the five books of Moses and then you're ready to start again. Learning never ends. Learning never ends. This is how this is, this is it works. That, that's this word, learning never ends, was the <coughs> announcement when we were in camp. In camp, there is learning classes. And the way learning class, everything gets announced on the speaker system. So when it came to the end of learning class, that was the announcement. Learning never ends, learning never ends. All children, please come to, port, to the sports activities. <laughs> <laughs> learning never ends. So now we are ready to start Bereshis all over again. A new beginning, new opportunities. And um, I would like to encourage everyone, those who are here, so we are preaching to the... To the to <laughs> those who are here, but if you know anybody who um, can benefit from learning and to set up a time for learning some of the parsha every week, Wednesday night is a good opportunity. In addition, this doesn't substitute, it doesn't um, take the place of personal study. A great suggestion by our great holy rabbis is, since the weekly parsha is divided into seven sections, known as the seven aliyot, and the week is divided into seven days. So therefore, every day of the week, you can have your own Chumash, your own Torah Bible with you. And every day of the week, you go through a section of that weekly Torah portion. Usually, if you open a regular classic Chumash, you're going to find Sheini, Shlishi, from first to second, second to third, till to fourth. You study it, and the best commentator you can study it and it's also in English or in any other language, Russian or French, whatever language you speak, is the commentator of Rashi. Rabbeinu Shlomo Yitzchaki, he was the, he's the, the, the leading master of commentary, making Chumish available to everyone. So this is just an introduction as we start the new year of Bereshit, and now, what we are going to do is discuss some subject in this parsha. Obviously, it's a long parsha, and every parsha contains many stories, many lessons, commandments, events. And a parsha like Bereshis, if you look at the amount of verses Bereshis says, Bereish, he says, at the end of the part, the book reads, it has 146 verses. 
146 verses. <coughs> so as far as verses are concerned, you may think, okay, it's so only 146 verses. It's not the end of the world. It could be short. Maybe we can spend a couple hours and discuss the old Parsha. <laughs> but on the other end, if you want to know how many years these 140 verses cover, does anybody know how many years? Ten generations. Ten generations. What is that? Fourteen hundred years. Just from the beginning of creation to the story of Noah, which is going to be next week. So to discuss fourteen hundred years in forty-five minutes in, a, in, a, in an hour, I think it's a little bit even in this um, very um, what do you call it? Um, very um, quick generation and um, and and and, 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 and uh, speed dial and so on. You still need a little more time than that. So the way we do it every week, usually, is that we try to concentrate on one particular subject and try to understand it and maybe to learn some insight. And mainly, it's not only to understand the story, but obviously, it's to personalize it because ultimately, Torah. The word Torah means hora'a, lessons. And this book is everlasting lessons into our lives. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to speak tonight about the snake. Okay? Known as the serpent. And the story of the snake is the famous story when Adam and Eve, the first created beings, were warned by God not to eat from a certain tree called the tree of knowledge, whether it was apples or figs or dates or grapes. Again, this is not our discussion because, like I said, I just want to make sure that that, that I'm not uh, being unsensitive to anyone, but that's why I'm, uh, I'm sure you have a lot, like I am, like everybody else does, want to know, okay, tell me about the tree. You mentioned Adam, tell me about Adam. We can we can see them stuff about every detail, but then it's not going to be a class. <laughs> so let's try to get to the punchline. Adam and Eve were told not to eat. They ate. God is very upset. And rightfully so, they blamed the snake. Apparently, what's clearly in the verse, that the snake is the one who convinced Adam uh, first, uh, Chava, as the story is discussed in chapter 3 of Bereshit, you want to look it up, it's on page 15, and <clears throat> chapter 3, it goes for about 14 verses, they call it um, the serpent's enticement. The serpent's enticement. The Torah begins that the Anachash Haya Rum Mikol Chayata Sadeh. The serpent was cunning or clever, and he was something beyond any beast of the field that Hashem has made, meaning that he was the most clever animal, according to our tradition, according to the Talmud. There are certain references in the Talmud that he actually looked very similar to man. He was even walking on two feet, and his eyes were very similar to, to human eyes. As we're going to see soon, he actually spoke, but no other animal did. He was a very different creature, like the serpent and snake family that we know today, descendants of that original serpent. And he got, and he started speaking. You see on verse, next, in the same verse, by Yomer Elaisha. And the serpent spoke to the woman. What's going on? Why aren't you eating from the tree? So you have a speaking serpent, a speaking snake. Did he speak Yiddish, Ladino, Hebrew? <laughs> Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah. It definitely, from the, from the way it seems from the simple understanding, the ca- different commentators share different insight. What does he mean he spoke? Did he spoke literally? Did he spoke by emotions? Did he spoke by hands? From Rashi, it seems that he spoke. He spoke whatever language Adam spoke, he spoke. He spoke the language. 
and it says to Chava, to Eve, what's going on? Without eating from that. I can tell you why God doesn't want you to eat. And he convinces you, and the next thing she knows, she eats, eats, and God is upset. Adam and Eve get their consequence for the way they behaved. They're getting chased out from a place called Garden of Eden. But let's turn a second to the snake himself, which I would like to discuss tonight, the consequences of the for the snake. So you can turn your chumash to page 17 in the English, verse 14. In the Hebrew, at verse 16, um, verse 14. I'm going to read it in Hebrew and translate it into English. Pasuk Yudalet. Vayomer Hashem Elokim El Amachash. And Hashem God said to the serpent, Ki asita zot, because you have done this, arur ata mikol abeima umikol chayat asade. Cursed are you beyond all the cattle and beyond all the beasts of the field. Meaning, you are going to be punished for what you did, and I'm going to give you a punishment that is going to make you less than any other creature that I had created. What is it? He tells them, Al gechoncha teilech, upon your belly shall you go, which as the Talmud tells us, when he told them, Al gechoncha teilech, that point, his legs were chopped up, meaning he had legs. But now, no more. You're going to be walking on your belly. Not like someone told me, because you have a belly, therefore you should walk. No, that's also true. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> you, I'm going to chop your legs off, so now you're going to be crawling on your belly. What about food? Ve'afar tochal kol yemei chayecha. And dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Meaning, he was eating what everybody else eats. A little herring, a little cholent, a little uh, sushi. I mean, what, 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 what did we eat? You know, food, human food. Hashem says, no, no more. From now on, dust. This is it. Sand. Number three tells them on verse 15, the Eva Ashis Bain Kho Bain Aisho. I will put an enmity between you and the woman. What does that mean? Ubain Zaracho, Ubain Zaro. And also, and between your offsprings and your offsprings. What is this referring to? That no no one of Chava or Chava's descendants will like you. They see a snake, they run. Oh, to the point, as the Torah may specifically says, Hu yeshufcho roish ve'ato teshufonu okeiv. English, where are we? He will pound your head, I'm sorry, he will pound your head, and you will bite his heel. This is the issue that we have with snakes. They are coming to our heel. What do we do? We see a snake. We don't try to grab him by his tail. The only way to get rid of a snake is to try to crush his head. That's it. There's all kinds of midrashic sources that snakes, if you don't cut their head, you can take different parts of them. They will still continue living and crawling and jumping, you gotta crush them all over their head. Next verse is what is the punishment for the woman? Separate discussion, which I don't want to go into now. That's not tonight's class, but if you want to know what the woman got, you're, lab you're about laboring in pregnancy. Thank you. You heard about the men having to work hard? 
Look in today's verses. You're going to find it all out. This is all consequences resulted directly by the nochash, by the snake. This is what the Torah tells us. Clear? Clear. Now let me share with you a small piece of Gemara, a small passage of Talmud, commenting on a verse regarding the snake. This is a verse in the prophecy of Yeshayahu. Isaiah the prophet prophesies the messianic era, how the world is going to look when it reaching a state of perfection by the coming of Mashiach. He talks about the gar ze'ev im keves, the wolf and the lamb who will live coincide each other in the same cage. They're not going to hurt each other. Beautiful prophecies. He talks about all different animals, how they're going to conduct themselves in that so-called ultimate, peaceful, and fulfilling world. And in the very same description, he says, In the future, the lion is not going to eat meat like he eats today. He is going to be a more delicate animal, like regular cattle. He is going to eat straw. He's going to eat straw. Huh? A vegan lion. Oh, <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Ve'aryeh kabakar yochal teven ve'nachash afar lachmo and the snake is going to have earth as his bread. Which if you look at the verse, the verse clearly indicates that the snake Everybody might change. The lion now is not the lion of the future, as far as the diet is concerned. But the prophet makes it a point to emphasize that the nachash, the serpent, the snake, is going to eat, his bread is going to be what? Earth, dust. Meaning that this curse that God gave the snake about the dust and the earth is an eternal curse never to be changed or removed from him even in the ultimate times. The Talmud interacted Yuma, page 77, 75. The Gemara comments on that verse. What is the meaning Venachash Afal Lachmo that the snake earth is going to be his bread? So says the Gemara that, first of all, that uh, he can eat all kinds of delicacies and still the taste of it is just going to be as dust, <laughs> okay? Or he doesn't get satisfied until he gets all the dust. This is all Talmudic opinions in this verse. But then says the Gemara, Tanya was taught in Abraise, Amar Rabbi Yossi, the great sage Rabbi Yossi says, he says, Bol Re'eh, come and see. Come and see at the different of the characteristics of God comparable to the characteristics of man, of people. Sheloke midat akadosh baruch hu midat basar vadam. The characteristics of God is clearly not like the characteristics of a human made of flesh and blood. What's the difference, says the Gemara? The characteristic of man is when someone is upset on his fellow, you're angry on him, you dislike him, you're ready more he descends upon the person's livelihood. What does he mean he descends? He attempts to agitate this fellow and cause him financial loss to any different possibility. 
If I have something against you, I'm going to go after you and try to cause all kinds of trouble. This is how human behave. God, in the other end, Avala Kodesh Baruch the Talmud says, is not like that. Kilelet Anachash, in one end, it cursed the serpent. What did he tell him? He told them, you are going to eat dust. Right? <coughs> That's what he told them, you're going to eat dust. Says the Gemara, and nevertheless, the snake goes up to the roof, its food is found there. He descends below, down the roof, his food is found there. Anywhere he goes, he finds his food. This is what the Gemara wants to bring out the beauty of God, that despite the fact that he's upset on the serpent, he's upset on the snake, nevertheless, he doesn't agitate him. He doesn't, he lets him go. He lets him go. This is what the Gemara says is the beauty of God. And the question, which many of you heard the question before, in that case, so where is the curse? <laughs> What's wrong? Seemingly, the snake is the one who got the better part of the deal. Humans have to work hard to earn a living. Animals have to fight for their food. The one who seemingly is the happiest, or as the Gemara says, God never took away from him food. He actually assists him. He says, whatever you go, you're going to get. And this is an expression of the characteristics of God, that despite the fact that he's upset on the snake, he makes sure that whatever he moves is financially taken care of. But in the other hand, if you hear that, you wonder, so where is the curse? <coughs> this is the question. Question is clear. Here I have a book. This book is called with the name Shmuat Yitzchak. This is a book of insights written by a great rabbi, one of the early Hasidic leaders and masters of Poland, with the name of Rabbi Yitzchak from Bork. Those who are a little familiar with Hasidic history, to put you in perspective, first of all, he lived about just a little less than 200 years ago when he passed away. And it's about 200 years to be, you know, uh, a general <coughs> idea. He was a great student of the seer of Lublin. After the seer of Lublin passed away, he turned to Pshischa, which was another great Hasidic dynasty in Poland. And when the Rebbe of Pshischa passed away, he became, he didn't come from a, from a rabbinic uh, family, but by the students of the Pshischa, he was um, elected to become their Rebbe, their leader. And he was known, the Bitschok of Barker was known in Poland as one of the early great Hasidic leaders. And the river, not much left of his teachings and his writings. But here I have a book, his name is Shmuas Yitzchok, which shares some of his teachings. He raises this question that we just spoke, and he asks what's going on. What is the curse? And he says something very profound. I share it many times, but I'm going to elaborate on it tonight a little. He brings that the curse is, he says, that God tells the snake, I am detaching myself from you. Meaning, when animals need food, what do they do? Hunt. Huh? Hunt. They hunt. What else do they do? You ever heard them making noises? You know what they do? Oh, it says in Tehillim, King David, who was sensitive and delicate to understand the sounds of animals, writes in Tehillim, chapter 104, He says, he describes different animals who are seeking out food, 
and calling out to God to provide them their food. Animals pray too. <laughs> think humans pray. Animals pray. And King David, in the book of Psalms, writes verses describing the prayer of animals. Yeah? A uh, quick question. This is kind of like a semantic question, but uh, does God consider plants to be alive? Yeah, sure. Um, so how does it work? Because plants, they make their own food. So how do, do plants also pray to God somehow? Apparently, not only they pray, they shake even too. <laughs> they pray like Hasidim. <laughs> Levakish Mikhail Achlom, he says. And when they ask, God provides them. Comes to, and that's their connection to God. That's the way they relate to God. By asking Him and begging in their own sounds and voices and callings. Provide us. Sometimes they get it easy, sometimes they have to fight for it. Just like humans, even when they pray and they daven, it doesn't mean that it ends up on their table. They still have to ride after davening, have to leave shul, go into their car and go to the office and try to, to materialize that, that, that request to be translated in Hashem's help. You still need Hashem's help because many people sit in the office and nothing happens. So you have to want to make sure that whatever you do in the office is going to be fulfilled. So you go and you turn to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is the connection. Animals have the connection. <laughs> Says the Bitzchok of Varki, what Hashem is telling the snake, I am detaching myself from you. Meaning, you're going to get whatever you want. So don't bother me. This opportunity that everybody else has to turn to me and to ask for something and connect to me by asking, that part I'm taking away. No more. And that is what the snake was cursed to the point that we saw before in the verse in Yeshayahu, in the prophecy with Prophet Isaiah talks about the future. And what does he say regarding the snake? Benachash afar lachmo to the snake, dust is going to be his bread even then. He said, an eternal curse that a snake forever is going to be in a position when God said, I don't want you. I don't want you. So you think, ah, what a Hasidic insight, getting into the psychology of the snake and making him, you know, Putting such a perspective on this old curse, which is beautiful in the one end, but the truth is, there is a Gemara which clearly speaks about that type of attitude that sometimes God has with people. And I will share with you a small reading from the Talmud, so you understand, so we can discuss further what and how this works. The Gemara is attracted tinies. And the Gemara says, you know, that usually this tractate is called Ta'anit. Ta'anit means fast. But it doesn't talk mainly about the fast that we are familiar with. Rather, this old tractate of Talmud is mainly dedicated of discussing issues which we had to deal with at times when there was no rain. And when there was no rain, that means there was no food. And then there was no food. Obviously, we all know what that means. So the sages of <coughs> other generations were organizing all kinds of fast days, which were days dedicated to prayer and a way of beseeching God to make sure that he provides us with rain. And there were different fasts. And the Gemara goes into different rules. When can you make the fast? When can't you make the fast? And how long should be the fast? And what happens if you started fasting and it started raining? What happens if you fasted and it still never rained? How, how far do you continue with this fasting? Obviously, a, a big part of it had to do with rain in Israel, which completely lives on rain. So this is a beautiful tractate of Talmud, that easy, but relatively easy to study. 
The Gemara says, listen to our Gemara. The Gemara says about a great sage, one of the Talmudic sages, which his name was Shmuel HaKatan. Shmuel HaKatan. In English, you would say the Malinke Shmuel. But he wasn't such a Malinke. He wasn't such a small person. Maybe he looked physically small. But he was one of the greatest sages that in one place the Gemara says that only in his merit the Jewish people are worth it, that the Shekhinah should dwell amongst them, of this rabbi. He was the one, the, the rabbi Gamliel, the leader of the Jewish people, entrusted with adding an additional prayer into the Amidah. The Amidah prayer that we pray three times a day is originally called Shmona Esre. Mm -hmm. The word Shmona Esre means 18 because it was originally instituted by prophets to have 18 blessings. And then there was a time the Jews dealt with certain challenges when they needed an extra prayer. But who would have the strength, the power to come and introduce a new request, take from 18, make it into 19? So Rabbi Gamliel, who was then the Nasi, the president, so-called, of the Jewish people, appointed this rabbi, Shmuel Akatan. He, the one, he says, I trust you. You can make up a prayer which is going to be according to God's wishes. And this is the prayer which starts with the words, Velam al shinim al tikva, the informers should not have any hope. There was a big issue with informers at that time. So he was a very, very special sage. Says the Gemara, Shmuel HaKatan once proclaimed a fast for rain. And lo and behold, rains fell for them, for the people, before sunrise. Meaning, usually the fast starts on sunrise. So he announced the day before in synagogue, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, Tomorrow is a fast day. Why? No rain. They all wake up. There is rain. What would you do? Make a kiddish, right? Mm -hmm. Make a kiddish. Listen to what he said. He says the people thought, wow, what, a, what kind of credit we must have in God's eyes that he fulfills our need before we even asked. Came Shmuel HaKatan. And he turned to the congregation and he said to them as follows. Once a servant went to his master asking him for a certain uh, portion. And knocking on the door. He's asking for a certain uh, request which he was hoping to get fulfilled. The master, wishing to avoid personal contact with the approaching servant. So he says to his agents, Tnulo, please give him what he needs, ve'al eshma kolal. So I will not hear if to hear the voice petitioning me. Shmuel says, you see, guys, we are in trouble. We were looking to pray tomorrow for rain. And God gives us rain and you're all excited. Credit, we must be great. I have a problem. If we didn't have a chance to pray for rain that came before our prayer, I'm concerned that God doesn't want to hear our prayers. He doesn't want to hear us, or hear us petitioning them. To me, it's troubling. This is the story of the snake. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear you. Prayer is an opportunity. To go and stand and speak before God is an opportunity. And then God comes and says, I'm going to make sure whatever you need, this, have, 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 have. I'm going to fill up your storage. Everything is going to be run properly, health-wise, financial-wise. And then you finish up the day. Did I speak to God today? No. Why not? Because so then you wonder, why? Why didn't I have the chance to turn to him? Is there something wrong? 
in, which we find exactly the opposite is when it comes to our patriarchs and matriarchs. We know that the Gemara, the Talmud tells us that our forefathers were all, you know the story of Sarah and Abraham not able to give birth, and Yitzhak and Rivka having trouble in giving birth, and Rachel having trouble in giving birth. And the Talmud is, uh, takes the, the privilege to try to discuss what's going on there. Why were they all dealing with, with infertility? Was it, was it something in the genetics? Something running in the family? <laughs> what, what, why are they all, so many people are having children and getting married? Uh, the only thing you hear is how do I, you know, what's the other type of birth control that can make life easier? But you don't hear so many people looking, there is the few that need help. You know what the Talmud says? That God planted such because he wants to hear them pray. What does he mean he wants to hear them pray? Playing games here? I'm going to sit and have fun while you pray? Wanting to hear them pray means I want to give them the opportunity to pray to me even more. Because as more they pray to me, and as further they pray to me, and as deeper they pray to me because their needs are so deep, then they are getting closer to me. And because I love them so much, I'm going to give them this opportunity to become even closer to me. I'm going to give them the chance to pray which is clearly going back to the snake, telling him, as they say in Yiddish, Nemdir in guy, take and get the heck out of here. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear you. Don't come. Go up to the roof. You're going to find your food. You go down to, to the pit. You're going to find your food. Don't come. Don't come in here. Don't come in here. Come to the This is clearly what... Clearly, this uh, story that um, the Barca says, he doesn't quote all these Talmudic passages, but this I'm only supporting, not supporting, I should say the word supporting, I'm only um, further establishing that insight, that Hasidic insight about the snake, and to see that this is actually what is being clearly discussed even by our Talmudic sages as far as the opportunity of prayer is concerned. The very fact is that we know that when God speaks about Israel in the Torah, we read it a few weeks ago, he says that Israel is completely different than Egypt. And how is it different? He says, what are you going to get? In, what, what is Israel so special that Egypt doesn't have? Remember that verse? In Pasha's Akev, I believe. Rain. He says, in Egypt, there's no rain. There's no rain. What happens in Egypt? The Nile River gets filled, overflows the fields, and that's how they have their vegetations. God says, I'm going to take you into a land. You know how great it is. You're going to get rain. What's, what's, what's greater about rain? Either way, the things are going to grow. Whether you're going to schlep buckets from the Nile River or the river is going to overflow the fields. What's the difference between rain and that? And what do our sages tell us? Very beautifully, the farmer stands in the field and he plants a seed and he plows his earth and he works so hard. And what does he do then? Lift up his eyes to the sky. I, I did mine, I need you. Ah, that's Israel. The opportunity to lift your eyes up. Egypt, a cursed country. Ervas Ores, the depths of the earth. What happens in Egypt? <laughs> You're not turning up there. Come on, have the Nile River naturally come, overflowing the country, I call, everything is fine. Don't turn to me, I don't need you guys. Once I'm going to bring you into the land, God says, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to bring you into a land, and there, and only there, and from there, all other lands, which are not Egypt. No one is cursed as Egypt. You're going to come, and in those places, 
you are going to be given the opportunity to, to daven. This is the farmer. There was one of the great rabbis who once told one of his Hasidim who was in the market and he spoke to him and he said, I, I'm, I envy you. You travel you're in the market. You can keep on looking up to the sky and asking for <laughs> Hashem for your help. The idea of enabling to realize the opportunity to turn your eyes to something up, that which was clearly taken, it goes even further. Because even this, the earth and the dust, also Hashem has to create. But it's clearly the way you get it. The way you get it is, here, take. Take it and go. Instead of providing it for you. Instead of showing a cheerfulness by, from God's face. Here, let me give you. Let me give it to you. I'm not just, you know, sometimes you give something to somebody that you really don't want to give it, but you have to give it. So what do you do? Behind your back, right? Okay, just take it. Throw the key. Throw a check. Throw it forever dollars. Your wife, your husband makes you crazy. They need extra money. Okay, and then, you know, take it. This is the snake. Take it. Earth. Find it. Go anywhere you want. You're going to find it. Just don't, don't, don't bother me. In davening, we have a prayer every day. By the end of davening, what do we say? The last blessing of Amida. Please bless us, our Father. Beor, what is Beor? With the shine of your face. Meaning, after we ask for wisdom and repentance and sustenance and redemption, right? Everything that we ask in the Amida, we add and we say, whoa, 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 I don't just want it. Please give it to me and give it to me because you want to give it to me. Don't play with me like the snake. Have it and move on. Give it to me because you really want to give it to me. And this is actually what this lesson, this unbelievable lesson that the worker over here says, the opportunity of praying. Then I was looking further. Where else do we find this idea of davening and to understand the privilege that we have just by turning to God and to pray to Him? So I saw an unbelievable insight, but this time it's from the Holy Baal Shem Tov himself. The Holy Baal Shem Tov. Here I have a book. I once shared with you some insight from this book. The name of the book is Degel Machane Ephraim. This was written by a grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov had one daughter and one son. And the daughter had already two sons. The two sons, one was Reboruch of Mezhebuz. They were both rabbis in Ukraine. One was Reboruch of Mezhebuz. And the other one was Reb Moshe Chaim Ephraim, also a small town called Sidilkov. It's also in western Ukraine, small city. Somewhere between Badichev and Mezhebuz. You had a small book, which in this book he shares insights that he heard from his grandfather. So the advantage of this book is that this is direct, direct insight from the Baal Shem Tov, meaning from my grandson who heard from his grandfather. He comments on a verse, which is actually in the Aftora of one of the Parshiyot that's in late in the end of the summer almost, Pasha's Kiseitse. The Aftorah begins with an interesting verse. Roni akara from the prophet Isaiah. Roni, Roni akara lo yalada. Sing out. 
a barren one who has not given birth. Ronim Sin. Akara, a barren woman who did not give birth. Loyalada. You read this verse and says, Allah, sing, the barren woman should sing for not giving birth. <laughs> what kind of singing is it? He brings an unbelievable insight from his grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov. He says the Baal Shem Tov explained it mainly by a parable. He says once the king opened himself up to the community and he says, Hevra, listen, an open opportunity, whatever you ask, you get it. I'm in a good mood, <laughs> okay? You can come in and ask. And whatever you're going to ask, you're going to get. No, nope. Someone comes and asks for this, someone comes and asks for that. And then there is the smart guy, and he says, before he comes in, he says, Oi, I hope the king cannot fulfill my wishes. So I have a second chance to ask him. And I hope he can't even fulfill that wish, so I can have a third chance to ask him. Because what greater can it be than to spend time in asking <laughs> and, 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 and talking to the king? Says the Baal Shem Tov, Roni Akara, this barren woman, is singing. You know why? Loyalada, thank God. He didn't give me my child yet, so I can ask him again. So I, can, so I can talk to him again. So I can down to him again. This is the Roni. This is the singing of the Akara. And so what's going on over here? Mm -hmm. God forbid you have a person who is in need. And usually we say, God, I'm in need. Take care of it. I'm coming to Shul tomorrow morning, please. I'm coming for this particular. Take care of it. Then somebody says the Bashan comes to Shul, says, God, take care of it, and he really hopes that God will not take care of it. So you can come back Friday and Shul again. Again and again. And feel like, oh wow, he's ready to hear me out again. He's ready to hear me out again. Ah, oh, how great. Ah, oh, how unbelievable is it? I am not like the Nachash. I'm not like the snake who once, you know, God said, I'm done. And over with you, and that's it. I don't want to hear you again. I want to have the opportunity to talk to you. I mean, we gotta take it in. In, in uh, this is I'm, I'm saying it the way the way he writes it, but this has to be taken <coughs> in context. God forbid anybody should 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 be you know in a situation that the council needs to pray for God. Okay, God should fulfill all our wishes, but the idea of yearning and, and, and hoping and waiting for yet another opportunity to turn to God and to ask from Him something is what the moral of this nachash, of the story of the snake is. Which is, by the way, there's a gemara for that too. <coughs> There's actually a, a beautiful Gemara. Everything is in the Talmud. There's <coughs> a Gemara on that too. The Gemara says in Yuma, this is a, a, Talmudic, a Talmudic statement by the Holy Master Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Everybody heard of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So beautiful that... You know, that's beautiful. What do you mean more than that? The Gemara says like this. Shalut al Midav, this is in Yuma again, page 76a. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you know, Shimon Yochai is the author of the Zohar. He's like the, he's the man, right? The greatest of the great. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's student asked him, Mipnei ma loyarad laem li Israel man why did the manna in the desert God provided us food 40 years it came every single day so the students of Rabshim Bar Yochai said 
Rosh Hashanah is once a year. Yom Kippur is once a year, right? What does God make him so fair? Once a year, give us a shower of manna and let us get, let us provide, let us sustain ourselves with that manna for the entire year. Next year, you get. So he tells them, I need to explain. He says, imagine a king more than once a year. Comes a greater king and he wants to give his son the opportunity to visit him every day. He says, here, take some money for today. Knowing that he doesn't listen tomorrow, his son is going to have another opportunity to come visit him. Yes, this is Talmud. This is not Rebbe Revorke, Degel Machne Ephraim. This is the way Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai understands and wants us to appreciate what happened in the manna, how the manna was provided, the way it was provided, simply to give us the opportunity to dive in every day and to meet God yet again. Sure, God can do it once a year, give you, you know, one check, take it for the year, we'll meet next year again. You know, I don't want to meet you next year again. I want to see you tomorrow. I want you to come see me tomorrow. I want to meet with you next week. I want you to come meet with me next week. And that, Rav Shiba Yochai explains, was the story of the man. This is the Gemara. This is exactly what we understand by studying the, 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 the little insight given by the Rabbi Avorka about the snake. He says, true. He has it easier than anyone. But he has it harder than everyone. He doesn't have the opportunity that anyone has. He never lifts up his eyes anymore. So he has everything. Prayer should not be a burden. Oh, you got to go to Shul again. Oh, Shachim. Oh, Mincha. I just pray coming off me. Would she really behave badly? And I wanted him to serve as a lesson to everybody else by taking away from him this opportunity. But everybody else... Enjoy it. Enjoy it. And this is very sometimes encouraging in situations that people go through. And I can tell you, even in my personal life, sometimes, you know, I was hoping something is going to work out easier. And I stand there by my davening and I say, the Benish Lelo, come on, make it work. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I'm looking for inspiration. <laughs> what do you want to say? Why let the snake eat? What? Why let the snake eat? Why? Why what? 